everybody. It's been lovely to watch you assembling this morning, ready for today's church service. Um, but before we begin the service itself, I'd just like to run through some of the privacy information for you, just as a reminder. Um, you can have your video switched on or off, but please remember other people will be able to see you if it's switched on. The chat box is also visible to people throughout the service, but do please use it for encouraging comments and for prayers. Um, holding your phone or your device in a landscape position gives a better experience than in the portrait position. Um, and also, if it's not clear to others who you are, um, could you please use the rename facility to identify yourself? You can switch between speaker view and gallery view, um, or you can swipe left and right to see other people, um, but speaker view is best for the main service. Um, parents, please remember that the kids' activities have been updated by Mark, and they can be found on My Church Suite under MCC Kids. So we'll all be muted once the service starts. So let's get into the service proper. So good morning and welcome to you all to our service today. A warm welcome to any people joining us for the first time and to anyone watching later on YouTube. We hope you enjoy your time with us and please feel free to contact us via our website if you'd like to connect further. Um, this week I was reminded of something written by Rick Warren, which I found very insightful. We often talk about life being a series of ups and downs, where good times and bad times follow each other. But he wrote that actually life is more like a train track, with good times and bad times occurring in parallel, side by side. So this morning, let's thank God for all that is good in our lives and let's hand over our troubles to him, at least for the next hour or so. Let's hand over our burdens to the one who promises to carry them. Let's give things to God who provides, to God who heals, to God who is our peace, and to God who is with us always. So let's just pray. Father God, thank you that you are always with us. We welcome your presence in our homes and lives right now. We know that there are many difficult circumstances to deal with at the moment in our world, but your word says that our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So help us to lift our eyes this morning to you, Lord, and open our hearts and minds to receive from you and be strengthened in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to worship now. Um, let's worship God as we sing Holy is the Lord, followed by Build My Life, which is led by James and Haley.
Thank you for that lovely worship, James and Haley. Beautiful words, lovely songs. The last song actually says, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken. We're going to hear now about a man of God um, whose trust in God would not be shaken. And he was quite a builder too. It's really important that you try and gather your children in for this next bit. Um, we have a lovely dramatic story, um, courtesy of Pete and Pauline. Noah? Noah? Where are you? I know where you are. You're building that boat again. You're 585 years old, no spring chicken, and always building the boat. Noah? Where are you? We're down here by the boat. I'm just getting it built. We've got to hurry, you know. We've got to be ready. Time's running short. Oh, it's like you're getting ready for the end of the world or something. Well, we are getting ready for the end of the world. God told me. How do you know it was God that told you again? Oh, he speaks to us all in lots of different ways, you know. The heavens shout out his glory. That's one way he speaks to mankind. He's been doing that for years. But also he can lay desires upon your heart. But let's face it, when he turns up in front of you and says, I want you to build a boat larger than an aircraft carrier, you don't mess around, you just get on and build it. And yeah, 85 years ago that happened, and I'm still doing it. Hmm, tell me again what he said exactly. Well, he said that his creations moved right away from him. And he's really upset about it. And what he's decided to do is to just start again from scratch. So, what he wants to do is to build an ark and we, as a family, are going to go into that ark with loads of animals but unfortunately the rest of the world's going to drown and die but then we're going to go off for 40 days and 40 nights when it's going to rain a lot and all the water's going to pour out of the ground and then we're going off on a cruise for more than 12 months but it's not going to be kind of a pleasant cruise because we're going to be mucking out animals and feeding them and taking care of them and basically living within this for 12 months until we find some dry land then we're going to start again from scratch that's all right isn't it yeah but what about all these people that keep coming and laughing at you I thought that's what that was then when you were walking down the route there. I thought, just stay quiet. Do you know all they come up from the village and all they do is mock me and swear at me and shout at me. I tell them, I tell them straight, I said, you're going to die, you're going to get flooded out. And all they do is laugh at me. And I thought you were one of those. No, uh, hey, not me. I tell you what, when they do this, I try and think of nice things. It's a bit like that bit out of the sound of music. You think of the nice things and I invented a word. Oh yeah, again, another word. <laughs> yeah, I like inventing words. I'll tell you, do you want to do it? Yeah, go on. Okay, it's called rainbow. Oh, and what does it mean? Well, I'm not quite sure yet, but it sounded pretty good, didn't it? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've also written a song. Okay. Well, tell me about the song then. You want me to sing it to you? Um. hmm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay then. All right, you ready? I don't know, because I haven't got the middle words quite right yet, but I've got the beginning and the end. It goes, The Lord told Noah there's going to be a floody, floody. The Lord told Noah there's going to be a floody, floody. La, 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 la. The money, money, none of the children of the Lord. So rise and shine. And na, 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 na. anyway, you could put give God the glory in there. Arise and shine and give God the glory. How about that? Yeah, wow. What are we having for tea? Locusts, of course. Oh, do we have to have locusts again? I'm fed up with locusts. Can we have baked beans and chips? Oh, not again. Yeah, I need baked beans and you chips. You always want baked beans and chips. I know. I've got to get on with this. I've got to hurry. We've got to be ready. Bye.
Absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you ever so much, Pete and Pauline. That was wonderful. What a well told account and a great reminder of the actual timescales involved for Noah and his family. 85 years building the ark. Um, there can be a lot of waiting, sometimes slow progress on the way to fulfilling God's call. And over these next few weeks, we're going to hear from some of our MCC family who have responded to God's call to be missionaries. And today we're going to hear from the Harrisons about their work with Reach Beyond, about what is happening during lockdown and how it's affecting their work. So please enjoy watching this next video. All of our missionaries and the work that they're doing, and it's so helpful to even see a halted video that had so much information in it um, that can just point us in the right direction to prayer. So let's just pray for the Harrisons and for the Reach Beyond team now, shall we? We'll just do that together. Lord, we pray for Martin and Ruth and for the work of Reach Beyond. We thank you for them and for how gifted you've, you, well, the, the way that you've gifted them and called them to this work. We pray for the people who are living in dire circumstances. Um, for those where access by aid ag agencies is halted, um, and we ask for your shielding and protection for them, especially from the COVID-19 virus. In the video, we, um, we were reminded of the poverty in Central Asia, um, how there's little access for food, but that there's a team that stayed there. And um, we just thank you for that. We, we thank you that there's a great witness to you going on in that place. We thank you that in Greece too, there was such an openness to the gospel. And we do pray that you would be making yourself known to people, even as they turn to you for themselves. We pray, Father, for whatever is going to happen on the new Fast Track programme, for the people who are going to go and start on that in January. We pray that all the preparation can still be done for that, and that as soon as there's a, a green light, that that can get up and get ready to go. 
We pray that you would be very much at work, strengthening and equipping the Harrisons and the Reach Beyond teams at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have our next worship hymn now. Um, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Thank you very much, James and Haley. A beautiful hymn, one that we probably don't sing very much these days, but um, it reminded me of singing it in school. And, um, I'm, and I'm just thinking how, how well I still know the words for these things that I learned as a child. Um, these wonderful truths that are written in the Bible and easily remembered through song. Um, God in three persons, blessed Trinity, merciful and mighty. Today we begin a new six week sermon series answering questions that were invited from the congregation. And today, Pastor Dave is answering the question, how do you reconcile the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament? He says he is diving in at the deep end as he asks, is God a moral monster? So let's just pray. Father, we pray for open hearts and minds as we hear your word this morning. We pray that you would still us as we get ready to listen and that we would receive all that you have for us this morning that we can then go ahead and put into practice in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Great to see you again. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is with us. Today we are starting a new series, a kind of um, answer your questions series. A number of you have submitted questions to us on a whole range of topics, and we've distilled it down to about six weeks worth of answering your questions. And today's topic is really hard. It's a tough one, straight out of the box here. How do you reconcile the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament? Or as I'm really approaching it, is the God of the Bible, especially the God of the Old Testament, a moral monster? Is he atrocious? That's kind of a caricature we hear a lot today, especially from atheists like Richard Dawkins, who will say the God of the Old Testament is such a moral monster that he's not even worth worshipping. Should he exist? Let me just read to you a quote from him. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. For him, it's a fiction, of course. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infant, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Wow, I'm sure he had to use his thesaurus to look up that. Um, in any case, that's where Dawkins is coming from. And this, this kind of dichotomy between the God of the old and the God of the new is even picked up by secular atheists, that the God of the old is full of wrath, full of anger, he's hateful, he's vengeful, and the God of the new is much more gracious and loving and kind and merciful. So what's going on there and how do we respond to it? Well, I think the first thing we need to say is the Bible makes no apology that God gets involved in the world and that God is personal and that God is passionate. The Bible is not embarrassed about God's emotions. He expresses love, he expresses anger, he expresses grief, he expresses joy. It's all over the scriptures. This is a God who is real and a God we can have a real relationship with. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think we need to say is um, Dawkins doesn't really understand God's holiness. Holiness is this all-encompassing attribute of God it's more than an attribute, it's his, it's his character itself, but it represents all the other aspects of his personality put together. His justice is part of his holiness, his love is part of his holiness, his goodness is part of his holiness, his forgiving attitude is part of his holiness. His wholesomeness, his holiness is altogether complete, nothing missing, nothing lacking. And it's that holiness we need to focus on because holiness contains a range of virtues both the hard virtues and the soft virtues. Let's look at this table together. The hard virtues include such ideas as truth, justice, temperance, righteousness, fortitude. And the soft virtues also include such concepts as love, forgiveness, mercy, kindness, and grace. God isn't one table over against the other. 
The two sets are not incompatible, though they look that way on the surface. God, in his creativity, in his altogether completeness, in his holiness, holds the two sets together in complete harmony and in a wonderful way. A good example to help us understand this is to think of a police officer, someone who works perhaps in counter-terrorism. They go out every day, they put their life on the line to defend our freedoms and to protect us. Think of what happens at London Bridge not so long ago recently. So if a police officer goes out like that and defends us and maybe has to arrest people or has to taser people or even in the worst case scenario has to shoot someone dead, we will say in the context of counter-terrorism, for example, that's still a good thing. It's a righteous thing that you're doing. We thank you for it. We uphold what you are doing in our society. We need defending from those who are so crazed that they would commit mass atrocities. Now, I take that same police officer. They come home, they take off their uniform and they engage with their kids and they play with their children. <laughs> and you see a whole different side of their character, a whole different range of virtues being expressed. They're gentle, they're playful, they're kind, they're laughing, they're maybe more intimate. There's just a lovely sense of family life there. And you would say, that is also good. The soft virtues that are being expressed there are wonderful. Just in sheer contrast to the hard virtues that were being expressed out on the street doing his job to save lives. But here's the point. It's the same person expressing both ranges of virtues. It's not two people, it's one person. Two different aspects of one person's virtuous living. And we applaud both. It's the same with God. God is both gracious and he's also just. And that's what Dawkins misses. That's what he doesn't get. See, we live in a postmodern culture today and postmodernity has been the swing of the pendulum away from the hard virtues. There was an overemphasis of that in the last age of modernity. There's been a big swing to the soft virtues, to the exclusion of the hard virtues today. So we live in a culture where love and kindness and mercy and inclusiveness and affirmation of these things is trumpeted and paraded and promoted. And if you dare say, well, what about absolute truth? Then you're an outcast and you're marginalized. Or you say, if you say, oh, there are absolute standards of righteousness, then you're seen as being bigoted and full of hate speech. So our culture has swung way to the left in, in this sense of the, the soft virtues being highlighted to the extent that I would say postmodernity is, is a culture that speaks post-truth. So keeping that table in mind, that's where you see where Dawkins has gone wrong. He's looking at God only through a postmodern cultural lens that focuses exclusively on the soft virtues. And he's basically saying, if God isn't like this, then I don't want anything to do with him. He's missing out God's complete holiness. That's the issue. If I take you a bit further into the next point, that is, here's a table of how God really acts in history, a pattern of his behavior, how he intervenes and how he acts. Look at this table together. The normal pattern of how God acts. Firstly, God creates in love and grace. You see that, for example, in the act of creation in Genesis 1. Then evil increases to the extent that God has to intervene. So you move from a soft virtue, God creates in love and grace, to a hard virtue. He has to intervene and put things right because man has used his free will for evil and increasingly so until it reaches a crescendo and God can't overlook it anymore. He has to intervene. He has to take action. Thirdly, then God sends a prophet to warn the people. That's again, a soft virtue being emphasized there. Fourthly, those who repent or those who are righteous are spared. That's a soft virtue of grace coming in. Fifthly, Judgment will eventually come if the people as a whole don't repent or turn away. The hard virtues expressed. 
And then sixthly, a fresh start begins again after the judgment, a fresh outpouring of love and grace for a new beginning. Now that is often how God moves in history. Three examples very quickly. One, you have the floods, the great big thing that the atheists often go on. How could God send the flood and destroy everybody? And we've just seen a wonderful rendition of that story by Peter and Pauline. Thank you for that. It was fantastic. But the global flood. But there you have it. First of all, you have God creating in love and grace, creation narrative in Genesis. But then evil increases to the extent that God has to intervene. It says clearly in the book of Genesis that God saw that the evil intentions of humanity's heart was just increasing and always being evil. Every imagination of the thought was towards evil. Thirdly, God sends a prophet. Who did he send to warn them? He sent Noah. How long was Noah preaching to them for? 120 years. 120 years until the flood came. That's plenty of time for them to heed God's warning to change their ways. Fourthly, any who were repentant or righteous were spared or saved. We know that. But in this case, only Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives believed the word and repented and got into the ark, believing that God would bring justice and judgment to the earth. Fifthly, judgment did come, but they'd had a grace period of over a century to repent. And then sixthly, there was a fresh start in love and grace when God says, now go out, Noah, from the ark with your wider family and replenish the earth again. Start again. So there you have a clear example of how God has moved from the soft virtues at the start in his creation act right through to the hard virtues in his judgment for those who don't repent and refuse to repent back to his soft virtues again when he opens up his creation for a new beginning, a new start. A second example we can look at is the Israelite conquest of Canaan. And again, that is often used by Dawkins and others to say how awful God is, how bloodthirsty he is that he brought in his own people and, and they annihilated the Canaanites. Now, that, that's a complicated story, but let me boil it down again. So first of all, God creates in love and grace. So after Noah, after the flood, God recreates again, free will, off goes humanity with a fresh beginning. Have they learned their lesson? No way. They go back into evil practices. Canaan, the land of Canaan, which is from Egypt all the way up to Damascus, roughly, uh, becomes a focal point for wickedness. In fact, you have the whole story of Sodom and Gomorrah taking place there, which was a local episode of God's judgment and grace at the same time. But we'll look at that again. But that happens in Canaan. And basically, God says, I need to intervene. But who does he send as a prophetic witness this time? Three patriarchs. He sends Abraham to live there. He sends Isaac to live there. And he sends Jacob to live there for most of his life. So those three patriarchs over a couple of centuries witness and give testimony how to live, how God wants us to live, how we are to behave. In fact, Abraham was involved in the Sodom and Gomorrah episode. He pleaded with God for grace and mercy over the times, but God couldn't even find 10 righteous. And so that became a living example to them. If you don't repent as, as seven nations in this wider region and area, that's what will happen. And over several centuries, they still didn't repent. They still didn't turn away from their wickedness. And in fact, God prophesied to Abraham. He said to him, 400 years from now, I will bring your descendants out of Egypt where they will become slaves, but I will release them and bring them out of Egypt to possess this land because the sins of the Amorites is not yet filled. So God told Abraham that the Amorites, which was one of the, the top tribes in Canaan at that time and represented symbolically the whole, the whole region. He said, their sins are not yet full. I am giving, I am giving them, he said, 400 years to repent. Now that's not a short time, that's a long time. That's the grace period being shown. 
the righteous were spared. Think when, when finally God's judgment came through the Israelites 400 years later, it says Rahab believed and her family was saved and anyone else in the whole area who believed in God's righteousness, who believed in God's ways, who believed that judgment was coming through the Israelites could easily have repented like Rahab and joined with Israel's people or even moved out of the area altogether. If you stayed and if you fought against God's judgment, then you were doomed. Now, there wasn't a wholesale massacre taking place there. Yes, there were some cities that did fall under the sword, but the, the people as a whole were spared, largely spared. And in fact, they lived among the Israelites for generations after. And so judgment did come, but the judgment was about this. It wasn't so much about killing every man, woman and child, which was a bit of hyperbole. It's how we might say, go and wipe out the opposition if you're playing a sports game. It was actually about changing the culture of the place from being wicked and polytheistic to becoming righteous and monotheistic. That was the change that God wanted to see. He didn't mind if other people lived with the Israelites and actually took on their culture. It was the fact that it was it was full of wickedness was the issue. Now, in our postmodern society today, many scholars are trying to downplay how wicked the Canaanites were, but the text itself testifies that their wickedness was great. In fact, in Leviticus 18, um, a lot of the mor morality, a lot of the moral code given to the Israelites is an opposition in contrast to what the Canaanites were doing. So Moses says to the Israelites, when you live in the land of Canaan, don't commit incest, don't commit bestiality, don't engage in homosexual acts, you know, don't commit adultery, don't offer your children in the fire to their, to their gods. These are all abominations. These are all morally disgusting acts in God's eyes, and he doesn't want it. And, and they says in Leviticus, actually, that the land, because the land has been so polluted by these acts, the land itself will throw the inhabitants out. It's a wonderful ecological perspective there. The land itself will vomit out its inhabitants because of the pollution they have brought by their wicked lifestyle. So that's God's balance between the hard virtues, which often today under postmodernism, we would call hate speech almost, but they're there, the hard virtues of God's truth and God's righteousness with the soft virtues that I give you generations to repent and turn and even when the judgment is falling, you can still repent and save your life. And the last example I'll give is Nineveh. So Nineveh, several hundred years later, is the capital of um, Assyria, which is northern Iraq today. And Nineveh was on the Tigris River and it was a very wicked city. It became very arrogant and proud and wicked. And God says, I have to intervene. What prophet did he send? He sent Jonah, the prophet who testified and said, you've got 40 days. It was a limited time frame, but still you have 40 days to repent. And here's the thing, the Ninevites repented from the lowest to the king himself. They all repented and said, almighty God, forgive us. We believe your prophet and God spared them. He did not bring any judgment on them. Hallelujah. So that's the heart of God revealed. He does not want, he does not take any delight in the death of the wicked. He wants to spare lives, but he will not back off from justice. He holds love and he holds justice together in tension. And it's the same in the new covenant. It's the same with Jesus Christ. And this is where people like Dawkins also get it wrong. They almost want Jesus to be like a hippie. It's all peace and love, man, and nothing else. That's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. It's the same God from Genesis to Revelation. Yes, Jesus embodied the soft virtues. He was full of love. He was full of compassion. He was full of mercy. He included people. He reached out to prostitutes and tax collectors, the marginalized and the excluded, and he brought the kingdom of God to them. Amen. But Jesus was also full of the harder virtues. He spoke truth. He made truth claims, and truth is always divisive. Once you say what something is, you're saying what something is not. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father father, but by me. That is a truth claim that is still as divisive today as it was then. He also clashed with the Pharisees a lot of times. He called them a brood, a brood of vipers. He called them sons of Gehenna, sons of hell. He also clashed with the priests and he, he cleansed the temple one time, made a whip. 
and actually chased the money lenders out and wouldn't let people come across the temple to buy and sell. That's the actions of no softy. That's a very a muscular um, faith in action there. So Jesus embodied both the hard virtues and the soft virtues. He was not crucified because of the soft virtues. He was crucified because of the hard virtues, because he spoke truth to power. That's the issue. He also embodied both and held both intention together. And that's epitomized wonderfully when he, he denounced Jerusalem and, and he said, you're doomed for your sins. But at the same time, he prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem for its sins. But at the same time, he wept over it. He wept. And so that pronouncement of doom, the hard virtue, God's righteousness is coming. God's judgment is coming. You need to repent. He gave them 40 years to repent. That's the grace period again. But then he also wept at the same time because he could see they wouldn't and the destruction would come. It's the same again in Revelation. You have the beautiful imagery of the meek and sacrificial lamb who offers himself for the sins of the world, the soft virtues of sacrifice and, and love for others. And then you have the hard virtues represented by the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he returns, he will come as a warrior king and he will trample the wicked nations under his feet and he will bring justice and therefore bring peace. No peace without justice. And sometimes you need to fight to bring justice. And so Christ holds the two together, the lamb and the lion, the soft virtues and the hard virtues. And that's what we've got to get. There's a key verse here in Jeremiah 9, verse 24. Let me read it to you. This is the key verse that sums it all up. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth. And that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. Do you see that? I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love, the soft virtues, and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, the hard virtues. I delight in both these things. See, God's holiness pulls them both together. So how do we summarize today's talk? Basically, we say Dawkins gets it wrong. He misunderstands. God's holiness. He may be a great biologist, but when it comes to philosophy and philosophy of religion and when it comes to theology, he's pretty poor. He gets it wrong because he misunderstands the difference between soft virtues and hard virtues within God's holiness. He gets it wrong because he just misunderstands the character of God. He's, he's cherry-picked and he's been looking at the answer, his, his answer, through the lens of postmodernism with its exclusive focus on the soft virtues. You know, the interesting thing is, I also think Dawkins has been a little bit hypocritical because if you take evolutionary ethics or social Darwinism and uh, you write that large across how we are to live as a society, you end up with brutal ethics, survival of the fittest, genocides, the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, social inequality, state atheism. Look at what happened in communist China or in Cambodia with the killing fields or in the concentration camps of North Korea when atheists have made atheism the state religion. That's what happens when you take Dawkins' natural ethics and say, this is how we are to live. And the interesting thing is it kind of slips out sometimes. So a few years ago, Dawkins had this famous spat on, on, on Twitter where a woman put up a, an honest question and said, I have an ethical dilemma. If I was pregnant with a Down syndrome child, what would I do? And Dawkins' answer, straight from the heart of Darwinian ethics, was abort the child. It would be immoral for you to keep it if you had the choice. It would be immoral immoral for you to keep it. Can you imagine that? There was a storm around that. He only semi-apologized, but that's when the veil is lifted of the ethics behind Darwinian evolutionary theory, when you say that's how we are to live. And the thing is, Dawkins is clever enough to realize the moral bankruptcy of his own position and how it would be the end of society if we were to actually implement what he believes to be the truth. 
And so he is backtracked and he's compromised. And in interviews over the last few years, he's very happy to call himself a secular Christian or a cultural Christian. You'll see quotes from that in newspapers and so on from interviews that he's done. In fact, he's even said, mm. we need religion to stop people from doing bad things or to stop our society from descending into moral chaos. And the thing is, he's not the only secular spokesperson who has seen the need for Judeo-Christian values. You have others like Jordan Peterson. You have others like Tom Holland, his book, the latest, latest book I'm reading at the moment, who are also standing up and saying, even if we are secular in our mindset, we need the value system of the Judeo-Christian tradition to hold our Western civilization together. Otherwise, we will implode with secular humanism takes us down a, a, a path of destruction. There's no moral foundation for it. It ends up in hedonism and relativism and relative ethics. And so that becomes a real problem. And so we got to pray for these secular prophets, as I call them, the Petersons and the Hollands and even Dawkins. Let's pray for Richard Dawkins. If God can save a persecuting Saul and turn him into an apostolic Paul, he can change and save Dawkins, amen. Let's pray that he moves from being a cultural Christian to being a born again Christian in Jesus name, amen. So that's today's talk. I hope you find some of it helpful and enlightening and it's given you some food for thought how you might wrestle with that question. Let's now use the chat box for a couple of minutes to put in your response to that, anything that, that has struck you, anything you, you think God may be saying to you in response and also any prayers you want to put in as you pray for secular friends to come to know Christ. Okay, use the chat box now. Thank you very much, Pastor Dave, for your talk today. Um, there's a lot of information in there for us to take away and to unpack. I expect there'll be a lot of us who will want to watch that again. Um, I didn't put anything in the chat box, but one thing that I was thinking was that um, I need to remember just who I am in terms of the big scheme of things and remember that, you know, God is God. Um, that I have a contribution to make, but that I, I'm not supposed to try and make God be my one-armed bandit God and for him to fit in with me. It needs to be that I am um, somebody who serves him, not the other way around. So I hope that kind of like fits with where we were going. Um, so as we go into this week, let's all reflect on God's steadfast love. We can see from what Dave said that his motivation is love. Um, he doesn't want to lose any of us. He wants to give us opportunities to repent and to come to him. Um, so let's just remember that that is God's motivation for each one of us, that we can have relationship with him. Isaiah 43 verse 3 says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. So to me that verse has both aspects in it, the Holy One and the Saviour. Um, this is summed up perfectly in our next song, One Thing Remains, God's Unfailing Love.
afternoon. Hi, everyone. Lovely to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Celia, for anchoring so well. Thanks, James and Haley. That was fantastic. Um, that was uh, a tough talk to do. It wasn't easy to get through. I, was, I struggled with it all week because it's not an easy subject, is it? But God is faithful. And I think some of the comments in the chat box have been really good. Uh, we are to, to learn to speak the truth in love. And that's holding the two sets together. The truth is the hard virtue. The love is the soft virtue. We are to learn to speak the truth in love. And we are to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to do that. Some of the other comments in the chat box were interesting. Pray for the younger generations, the younger generations to have their heart opened up to God's wisdom on this area, because they're the ones growing up in a postmodern society with its swing of the pendulum to the soft virtues, where it's much more difficult to speak the truth uh, without being labeled a bigot or whatever. So we need to pray for our young people to have the, the mind of Christ on these areas and to have boldness as well. A lot of you saying pray for the right words and how we testify to others. I hope some of the tools, some of the tables in the talk will help you in that. And others praying for family members who don't yet know Christ. I mean, I have lots of secular friends, even in my wider family as well, um, agnostics or atheists. And yeah, we need, we need to kind of keep praying for them to come, come to Christ. A couple of you asked about um, books or, or books we can share. So, um, Matt, I'm just, can you put the slide up? Yeah, this, here's a few books that I used uh, in preparation for this talk today. Um, the one on the left, The War on Truth, was brilliant. So by Mark Fairley, he's a Scots, Scotsman, young fella, um, but really, really good. In fact, I took some of the framework from that book for the talk. It's really accessible in layman's terms. Uh, the, the whole kind of two, two sets of values thing and where postmodernism is in that. Um, so that I would get it on Amazon, all these books you can get on Amazon. I would really recommend if you want an easy lay person's read, The War on Truth by Mark Fairley. Is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copen? He's a professor of ethics and philosophy in Florida. Um, evangelical Christian, I would say again, very good. He goes through the whole Old Testament. There's a passage especially on, on the Canaanite Wars. Well worth getting into, a bit more academic of course. And then the one on the right, The Lost World of the Israelite Conquest by John Walton and his son, uh, Harvey Walton, is also good. It's a bit more liberal evangelical, but still within the liberal evangelical camp, if you like. Still evangelical in the broad sense, um, but also some good insights in there as well. So if you want to go deeper into reading, those are three books you can find. All right, that's it for me. We'll keep praying for each other and lifting up these requests to God. And I'll hand over to Pastor Tim to wrap up the service today. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, great. I found that a great morning again. Great teaching. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you for the worship. Um, I want to say uh, especially uh, well done to Celia. I thought uh, you led anchored really well. So thank you, Celia. And um, yes, Pete's, Pete's portrayal of Noah, I think, is going to live long in our household. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you, Pete, for that. Um, I'm going for the kind of Samson look, just without the muscles, without the super strength. Um, I'm going to whiz through a, a couple of notices before we close and we have our final bridge song. And I'm going to explain what's going to happen after the bridge song, which is a bit different today, but I think it's going to be good. So in terms of our notices, thank you to everybody who has already responded to uh, the email, the MCC email about uh, surveys, uh, surveys for how we go about getting back into the building uh, post a lot or as lockdown eases rather and um, how we begin to open up our building particularly on a Sunday morning what corporate worship is going to look like um, and we really want to get as many people's perspectives and views on that as possible so we can have a real sense of where where the church is it's, it's all right for the SLT or the MOT to have their theories but it's good to, to hear what people uh, would like in that. So 69 people have already uh, replied, which is amazing given the, uh, the email went out only very recently. It is very quick to do. So it's a, it's a five minute job really. So we would really be grateful if anyone hasn't done that and would like to ideally by this Thursday, then we can kind of collate the data and come to some conclusions. So that's the moving back into church survey. Uh, a couple of things from the youth and children's side. Um, uh, as, as Celia mentioned, Mark is, is continuing to update the uh, website for the younger children, which is great. And we have uh, uh, 
youth Bible study. Um, we've got YF uh, this evening and we've got a new Bible study series for the youth starting from next week. Uh, so sure wanted me to, to uh, raise that. And also reaction. So reaction has now started again online, which is great. And uh, there's been two sessions so far. And the next reaction is on Thursday, this coming Thursday, half past six to 7.15, so just 45 minutes. I'm sure you've got time for your young uh, people, if you've got them in the house, in that age group, to, to find time to join the reaction uh, team for that on Thursday. Okay, final thing in terms of notice is, is that after we've had our final song, um, we're going to have an opportunity to chat to catch up with folks, but it's going to be a bit different. You're going to be randomly assigned into a breakout room. Uh, so if you took part in the quiz or the last prayer meeting, you'll know those little breakout rooms are just the same experience as Zoom, but you're in a much smaller group. And we thought that would be much more helpful to kind of enable conversation and chat rather than having a sort of hundred way conversation uh, as, it, as it is at the moment. So you'll be randomly assigned to a group and hopefully that will be a really nice experience Obviously, of course, you can you can leave at any stage, but it'll just make conversation a little bit easier. So stick with us and look out for that after the final song. OK, I'm just going to I'm just going to pray to close and, and draw the draw the service to a close. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for what we've uh, learned this morning, what we've been uh, blessed in hearing how our worship has uh, enthroned you on the heavens, Lord. We. We thank you that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of Yahweh, of, of Israel's God, the God of the Old Testament. That Jesus Christ, scripture says, is the same yesterday, today and forever, that God's nature does not change. We thank you for that and we thank you that that is the, the confidence um, in which we stand as Christians. We thank you that the New Testament is, is, is a document soaked in as many as 900 different quotes and allusions to the Old Testament scriptures. So it is, uh, from beginning to end, completely saturated in uh, the religion, the thought, the scriptures of the Old Testament. We thank you that our faith is, is like Jesus, the robe in which Jesus was crucified, a seamless whole of Old and New Testament. We thank you for the, uh, the integrity of the Christian faith and the way uh, all the New Testaments speak of the same God, the way Jesus Christ is present in the Old Testament and the way Jesus Christ fulfills the Old Testament. Lord, give us wisdom as we uh, learn to share these truths with those around us, especially those who don't believe. Help us to be gracious and kind in our uh, conversation, in our evangelism, in our witness. And we ask you to be with us this week, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, bye from uh, me for now, and we'll enjoy our final worship song. God bless.